Good morning, everyone. We'll get started with grand rounds uh, today. Uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Swenson and Dr. Samir Kapadia, I'd like to welcome you to a very special grand rounds this week. Uh, this is the annual Razavi lecture, and I think it's a very apt week to have it because this is the week we celebrate graduation, and Dr. Razavi has been and continues to be a very great supporter of the Cardiovascular Fellowship Program. So it's great to continue this tradition with this annual lecture. And we have a wonderful visiting speaker today, Dr. Judith Hockman, who is Professor of Medicine at NYU, uh, and a very special uh, person to me as she has been my clinical mentor for many, many decades now. Um, Dr. Hockman completed her medical school at Harvard and then went to do medicine at the Peter Bent Brigham and then went on to do her cardiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins where she has a very strong association with the Cleveland Clinic in that her mentor is Bernadine Healy with whom she did her early work on infarct expansion and infarct extension. Uh, I had the distinct privilege of being her intern resident fellow and faculty member for over a decade on the Upper West Side and uh, everything that I do has been influenced by those 10 years. Dr. Hockman's contributions uh, to cardiology and especially clinical trials has just been profound. Uh, she's had done three landmark NIH trials, uh, the shock trial, the occluded artery trial, and now the ischemia trial. And I could think of no better person to talk to us today about the ischemia trial, which was completed last year, and its impact. And then we'll open it out to a group discussion with an interventionist perspective with Dr. Ellis and a surgeon's perspective with Dr. Bakim. And then if we have time, we can have a, a group discussion at the end. So Dr. Hawkman, I'm sorry you're not in Cleveland, but a warm welcome from Cleveland to you. And we so look forward to your talk this morning. Dr. Hawkman. Well, th thanks, Venu. Uh, it's good to be with you, at least uh, virtually. And um, uh, Venu, it's just remarkable to me. We've been collaborating for more than three decades, and um, uh, it, it's uh, your accomplishments are are amazing um, as well. So we have a mutual admiration um, going on here. I've got a brief time to talk about ischemia, the ischemia trial, and set the stage for uh, what I anticipate will be a very interesting discussion. So here are my disclosures. Uh, it was NIH funded, but we did have donations to sites from these uh, vendors. So just to sort of set the stage uh, for what we, everything we do in cardiology and in medicine, to remind us that the primary goals of treatment are to improve survival and to improve angina and quality of life. So mostly we're gonna focus on survival and other events associated with survival like myocardial infarction. I'll touch on angina and quality of life at the end because of course it's incredibly important. And these goals should govern management decisions including whether and when to revascularize. So we asked the question, what is the evidence that a routine strategy of prompt revascularization after a diagnosis of stable ischemic heart disease is made improves survival or reduces clinical events? And there were many meta-analyses. Um, you're very familiar with the literature, so I'm not going to dwell on it. I picked this one because it included patients who had ischemia documented at baseline and I had high statin use and high stent use. And you're all very familiar with the more modern trials and no reduction in death or uh, MI. So, we don't really have time to go into in detail why have the randomized trials not demonstrated a survival benefit for fixing these stenoses. Well, we know there's a dissociation between the angiographic or physiologic severity of a stenosis and underlying atheroma and propensity to become a culprit lesion, the vulnerable plaque and the vulnerable patient. We know that atherosclerosis is a systemic disease with diffuse coronary artery involvement. And medical therapies change your underlying biology and natural history of atherothrombotic disease. And as the field evolves, in fact, we have newer medical therapies even since the ischemia trial was completed. So the design limitation of some of those prior trials I just showed you that we address specifically in the ischemia trial is that previously patients with mild or no ischemia were included. Revascular procedures were not optimal, 
And importantly, referral bias by randomizing after a catheterization. So we randomize before the catheterization and small sample size. And we look to the literature to see if there's any high risk group not focused on in those prior studies in whom um, revascularization may improve death or MI in the era of modern therapy. And you're all very aware of the classic paper from Cedar sinai Rory Hakamovich, Dan Berman, which showed that uh, if you had more than 10% inducible ischemia on a stress nuclear spec test and selected for revascularization versus not selected for revascularization, there was superiority of revascularization, but only for those with a, a, a higher percent of the ventricle with inducible ischemia. And that's exactly how we framed the trial. So we asked the question in stable patients with at least moderate ischemia and a stress test, is there a benefit to adding cardiac catheterization and if feasible, revascularization to optimal medical therapy? And here's the organization we had, it really took a village to complete this. Dave Marin was uh, the study uh, co-chair and uh, you could see the coordinating center was at NYU, Cisco and Data Coordinating Center at, at Duke. We had a very broad tent in terms of the leadership committee and the executive committee. Core Labs read everything. I just want to back up and show you that everything was read by the Core Lab, EKGs, all of the uh, images. So we, uh, the sites enrolled uh, 320, si 320 sites, randomized patients, and they uh, overall enrolled 8,518 patients who had locally determined moderate severe ischemia on a stress test. So that was a local determination. Most of them submitted a stress test for review by the core lab before they went on to randomize. And that's where you see here that over a thousand patients had insufficient ischemia and did not go on to randomization because the core lab said not enough ischemia. No obstructive disease on CCTA, over a thousand, and unprotected left mid 400. 400. Uh, so if the coronary anatomy was not eligible, they were screen failed. And uh, if they had no obstructive disease, but have had ischemia, and symptoms, they went into an ancillary study that Harmony Reynolds led that was 66% women. And if they had low GFR or were on dialysis, they went into ischemia CKD, a parallel trial led by Sri Paul Bangalore. The key exclusion criteria were ACS within two months, highly symptomatic patients who we thought would need catheterization and revascularization. We didn't want a lot of early use of cath and revasc in the con group. Um, and left main stenosis or low ejection fraction. And uh, 5179 were randomized. 73% uh, of them had a study CCTA. They were randomized to one of two strategies, optimal medical therapy and routine cath and revascularization if feasible versus medical therapy with cath and revasc reserved for failure of medical therapy. So it was a strategy trial. It wasn't that they couldn't have cath and revasc ever. The median follow-up is 3.2 years and a very high proportion of the follow-up that was expected was completed. The notable baseline characteristics are a high proportion of diabetics, preserved ejection fraction, history of angina in 90%. However, they were medically treated after their stress test. And um, many of them became angina free during that period between enrollment and randomization or between the stress test and, um, and enrollment. Angina began, began or became more frequent over the past three months in 29%. And we'll go over the angina in a little, in a little bit. So in fact, the sites randomized exactly who we wanted them to randomize. The core lab read severe ischemia in 54%. So the majority had severe ischemia moderate ischemia, and some did not submit the stress tests for review by the core lab before randomization. The core lab then said it was mild um, or no ischemia. The anatomy, most had triple vessel disease by a 50% stenosis, and uh, LAD almost in almost 90% and uh, equal between the two groups. 
and Prox LED in half of those. So optimal medical therapy, I don't have time to go over it. I just want to show you that the percent that reached LDL target, which was less than 70, was increased over time, but we've got a big gap. We were not, not even close to reaching 100% uh, of target by the last visit. The same was true for blood pressure, significantly increased uh, to the blood pressure systolic goal, but far from uh, optimal. The invasive strategy, uh, cardiac catheterization, you always see the invasive group in red and the conservative group in blue. Um, uh, essentially, uh, almost everybody in the invasive strategy had a calf. In the conservative strategy, uh, in a high 20%. Um, but it, what's very important is that this dashed line represents procedures performed after a primary endpoint event. And these don't reduce the trial power to observe between group differences. Revascularization, there were about 20% that were deemed not suitable for or didn't need because it was insignificant disease uh, revascularization. So about 80% had it. In the conservative group, those that had a revascularization that was not preceded by a primary endpoint event was about 16%. So quite a large difference between the two groups. I think this is as good as you're going to get. Three quarters had PCI. We're going to hear about PCI and cabbage uh, a little later in the program. Um, uh, a quarter had uh, a bypass surgery, high proportion with stent use, including drug eluding stent use, high proportion of internal mammary. And you all know the primary uh, results. Uh, the primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, or hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest, all independently adjudicated. Uh, by a CEC clinical event committee. There were crossing curves, non proportional hazards uh, with a 2% in favor of the invasive uh, of the conservative strategy early on. And in favor of the invasive strategy later, the shading indicates the half width of the confidence interval for the difference and a lack of overlap with the lines. Um, so it shows that it, the 95% confidence interval excludes zero. So very little lack of overlap, a little lack of overlap uh, right here. Uh, the secondary, major secondary outcome, which was the initial primary outcome of the trial was cardiovascular death or MI. It's the exact same pattern because myocardial infarction drove the, all the endpoints. It was the most frequent endpoint. You see the exact same early hazard um, and late difference in favor of the invasive strategy. And here is myocardial infarction. Um, later, I will show you procedural versus spontaneous. Here's cardiovascular death. And, you know, the question is, is there a difference emerging uh, later in time, which speaks to a meta-analysis that I have a slide of uh, later, whether long or follow-up, we'll see a difference in cardiovascular death. Now, in contrast, all-cause mortality was absolutely overlapping for the entire period. And with the really good care they got, even though they weren't at target for LDL and blood pressure, the mortality rate for those with triple vessel disease, a severe ischemia in the modern era, at four, four years was quite low. Hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest, these were very infrequent events. This favored um, the invasive strategy. This favored the conservative strategy. These were both significant. We're not really sure why they were excess hospitalization for heart failure. Very few resuscitated cardiac arrests. And uh, very good. We selected our sites very carefully. They didn't have a lot of strokes, procedural strokes, and there was no difference between these groups. If you look at a net clinical benefit where you add stroke to the primary, it's the exact same configuration as I showed you with the crossing curves. There was no heterogeneity of treatment effect by any subgroup here of the diabetics and non-diabetics, invasive better, conservative better, uh, new or more frequent angina in the last three months, guideline-based medical therapy at baseline, achieving goals, no, no heterogeneity. And I will dig in a little bit more to ischemia and uh, anatomy uh, potential interactions in a little bit. So if you put together the CKD trial with 777 patients and the ischemia trial, you get almost 6,500 patients. 
So I'm going to run through this quickly. The invasive favors on the left, favors conservative on the right. They'll all be formatted by CKD stage one, two, three, four, five. And you can see for death, all cause death or MI, no heterogeneity by stage of CKD. Here is uh, adding the other three softer endpoints, no heterogeneity. All cause death, P of 0.08, but we had so many looks that you really, that is nowhere near significant. Uh, you know, this is just uh, by chance finding, I'm sure that the, looked like the con was favored for stage four. Myocardial infarction, no difference overall. The procedural MI, not surprisingly, overall procedural MI favored CON. And importantly, spontaneous, the non procedural MIs favor the invasive strategy. And that's a consistent finding um, in the trial. Stroke, uh, it, it, there was an excess of stroke when you added CKD for uh, the invasive strategy, so it favored CON. And, and death or new dialysis also was a trend toward more in the invasive group. Now, I just want to briefly touch on the different definitions because this is of myocardial infarction, because this raises a lot of controversy when you're comparing conservative management to invasive management, when you're comparing PCI to cabbage. How do you define myocardial infarction? So we had a very stringent primary definition, which was very much like the sky definition. And we had a secondary definition that reflected the universal MI definition. And so you can see on the left that for the primary definition, they were very similar overall MIs, uh, MI uh, numbers. Whereas in the secondary definition, we had many more myocardial infarctions in the invasive group, not surprising. So you see the the, the Orange and the yellow are type 4 and type 5, and of course there are more, whether it's the primary definition um, or the secondary definition in the invasive than the conservative group, but it's much, much more uh, for obvious reasons if you have a more sensitive diagnosis uh, of MI. This predominantly looked at troponin as the prioritization marker. This had CKMB as the prioritization marker. Spontaneous MIs were reduced in the invasive um, group, whether or not you use the primary or secondary uh, definition. So we looked at the prognostic significance by MI type and definition. So on the left is the primary definition. On the right is the secondary definition. All cause death is at the top, cardiovascular death at the bottom. So if you look at um, the type 4, B, and C, and in type 1 MIs, so spontaneous and procedural MIs, the hazard ratio for subsequent death was very high. And that was true whether you had the primary or secondary definition because they were very similar. But if you look at the procedural MI, um, there was a 1.5 hazard ratio, but not significant for subsequent a risk of subsequent death for all cause death, but that was significant for cardiovascular death. So the procedural MIs by the primary definition did increase the risk for subsequent death by the primary definition. And that hazard was three. <laughs> by the secondary definition for procedural MI went down to 1.6 and was no longer statistically significant. So we think we got the right definition. We wanted a definition of procedural MI that was clinically significant, clinically relevant, um, and that was certainly more prognostic than the secondary definition. Now, that context for the MI reduction with spontaneous, for spontaneous MI in the invasive group is influenced by and confounded by the expected and appropriate differential use of DAPT over time between the invasive conservative strategy. And you can see that for those who had PCI, about 100% had it. And not only that, they, had it, they, they were given DAPT for quite a long time, and DAPT in, at least in the Pegasus trial, has been shown to reduce myocardial infarction. So that it, it it's, uh, confounds the uh, understanding of the mechanism of the reduction of spontaneous MI. So now let's dig into what are some pretty interesting heter potential heterogeneity um, um, data. 
So the first observation was that within within um, the cohort that was enrolled, meaning they were thought to have moderate or severe ischemia at the site, there was no difference in outcome. This is the primary outcome for severe ischemia, moderate ischemia, or mild or no ischemia. You could see that these event rates are the same. And there was no differential, there was no interaction between degree of ischemia and treatment effect, invasive versus conservative. You can see the crossing curves, here the curves don't cross much, but really no interaction between uh, treatment and degree of ischemia, and furthermore, um, no independent relationship between degree of ischemia and outcome. And if you look at all cause mortality, the same thing, ischemia severity was not independently associated with death. And you can see that uh, those, those death rates were the same across the degrees of ischemia and no interaction, uh, no differential treatment effect by degree of ischemia. Now that was not the case for anatomic severity. So CAD severity was independently associated with the primary endpoint. Duke 6 is triple vessel disease by 70% stenosis or double vessel and prox LAD by 70% stenosis. And this is the one that the guidelines say you should use bypass surgery to improve survival. And there certainly looks like um, a benefit for uh, the invasive strategy um, for Duke 6. That was not true for Duke 5, which is less severe disease. and or Duke four or Duke three, you can see that the absolute event rates are uh, uh, highest for Duke six as expected, they go down as you go progressively to less severe coronary disease. However, the interaction uh, test for statistical heterogeneity across these is not significant. Now, this difference is really driven by myocardial infarction. So spontaneous MI was reduced to the greatest extent, and almost exclusively, in the Duke 6 uh, patients, although once again, no statistical uh, interaction. Now, if you look at um, by triple vessel disease without prox LAD here, so you don't look at the Duke score, this is three vessel disease, two vessel disease, all by 70% stenosis, one vessel, um, and no vessels, meaning there is disease, but nothing that the uh, core lab measured by QCA um, as greater than 70% stenosis. Um, and here you see also a signal toward a reduction in the invasive group, not as striking as the Duke 6. And um, if you look at all cause mortality for Duke 6, you see no difference. So all of that myocardial infarction difference in favor of invasive is not translated at years four and five to a reduction in all-cause mortality in this sample size. And here is all-cause mortality by triple vessel disease, double vessel disease, single, and no 70% stenosis. Now, there's some interesting data in low ejection fraction patients, but I, I caution that we have very few patients with low ejection fraction. So here is the risk of the four-year primary outcome, the five-component composite, based on ejection fraction as a continuous function, showing the two treatment groups in red and, and blue. And if you have no prior history of heart failure, no matter what your ejection fraction is, these curves uh, overlap. In those with prior heart failure, which is only 4% of the population, tiny, tiny numbers, there is a suggestion that with the invasive strategy, there's a lower event rate than in the conservative strategy. And this needs more investigation. If you look at all-cause mortality, uh, shown the same way, nothing is going on here with low ejection fraction, albeit small numbers. Here are quite tiny numbers of patients, but once again, a suggestion, something going on potentially in the combination of those with prior heart failure and low EF, which really uh, suggests that the STITCH trial, perhaps uh, the ejection fraction cutoff shouldn't have been 35, 
perhaps it should have been 50 or 45. Now, I don't really have time to get into the complete revascularization data that Greg Stone uh, just showed at uh, the um, ACC. But if you look at the invasive versus conservative primary outcome and all the other outcomes in the ischemia trial and the difference, the absolute difference in event rates at four years, if you look at anatomic complete revascularization, you get one more absolute percentage point benefit um, in an adjusted model or a marginal structural model. The functional revascularization, there's absolutely no difference if you judge functional revascularization and pretend that the entire invasive group had functional revascularization. There's no difference. So just briefly, I'm going to touch on um, angina related uh, quality of life and the probability of being angina free. So if you look at those with daily angina at baseline, weekly angina at baseline, monthly or none, invasive versus conservative, you see that if you had weekly angina at baseline, you had a, a probability at three months of being 15% angina free, 15% chance of being angina free. In contrast, if you had underwent the invasive strategy, you had a 45% chance of being angina free. So a marked improvement in being angina free with the invasive strategy. And if you did not have angina at baseline, if you were treated medically and you responded, there was absolutely no difference. This was durable at 12 months and durable at 36 months. This is the first trial to show the PCI resulted in a durable benefit over time in terms of improvement um, in angina. Barry 2D had shown that for cabbage already, and we just confirmed that. So in summary, ischemia is the largest trial of an invasive versus conservative strategy. There was no statistical evidence of, uh, of a difference in any of these outcomes, but spontaneous MI was reduced. Procedural MIs were increased, spontaneous MIs were decreased. There was no heterogeneity of treatment effect. It had limitations, which you're all uh, very aware of. Here's a meta-analysis where Sripal added ischemia and CKD to some of the other more modern trials and looked at all-cause death, no difference, looked at cardiovascular death, no difference, looked at myocardial infarction, no difference. Of course, there was uh, excess procedural MI in the invasive group and reduced spontaneous MI in the invasive group in this meta-analysis. And you're probably aware of the very new uh, meta-analysis that went back um, to 19, the publication in 1979, which means the trial started before 1970 probably, included some very old trials um, and showed that with longer follow-up, there was a reduction in cardiac uh, mortality with about a 1.1% reduction over an average of 5.7 years, which is about 0.2% per year. Why they chose to include the, the, the trials they did, I don't know. They left out the occluded artery trial, which uh, uh, is near and dear to my heart and uh, met all their uh, inclusion criteria, but uh, uh, so be it. That's the problem with meta-analyses is what you select. All-cause mortality uh, was no different. The hazard ratio was 0.94. So as in the ischemia trial, we're seeing a little bit of a dissociation between all-cause mortality um, and uh, benefit of cardiovascular mortality. We are following our patients long term. Uh, for cardiovascular death as the primary outcome and all cause mortality as the secondary outcome. So I'll just say in, in the last uh, few seconds, I think I'm going to actually stay on time, the implications for patients with moderate or severe ischemia is that a validated measure of patient reported quality of life should be collected before deciding about an invasive strategy. From a safety standpoint, it's not necessary to rush to the cath lab if you treat the patients well medically. Either strategy is appropriate and we should engage in, in uh, shared decision making with patients. We should recommend revascularization for patients with symptoms if that's their preference after informing them of the ischemia results. We should not recommend revascularization for people without symptoms if left main disease has been ruled out. So in other words, the strategies are fairly uh, equal. 
uh, there are advantages to some, advantages to, to the other, and we need to engage in shared decision making. Uh, it took a village to do this, and I just want to um, uh, show some pictures to remind us of uh, the village that it took with over 320 sites. These are some of the sites that I visited uh, as I went around the world. And I will stop and thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion later on. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hawkman, for that terrific overview. And congratulations to you and your team for doing, embarking on and then completing such a fantastic trial that's going to really dictate our management of stable ischemic heart disease in the years to come. And so we thought we'd continue with this with uh, Dr. Ellis, who's Professor of Medicine and Director of Interventional Cardiology uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic, talk a little bit about an interventionist perspective on the results of the ischemia trial. So Dr. Ellis. Good morning, Vinu. Good morning uh, to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear and your slides are clear too. Good, all right. Well, um, it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to be able to talk to this group about this very important trial that Dr. Hockman has very ably reviewed. These are my conflicts of interest. And I wanna start by reviewing a quick history of intervention because it really gets to the central theme of my talk. Many of you know Andreas Grunzig performed the first angioplasty in a human coronary angioplasty in 1977. These are pressure tracings from that procedure and images below, it's a proximal LAD. And in fact, the balloon only result held up for about 20 years. But the problems with balloon only angioplasty, namely restenosis and acute occlusion. So stents were developed by uh, the pioneers who are listed below. Uh, you may be interested to look at the early stents that were used. On the top is a wall stent, it's a little hard to see. But look at the middle stent. That's a Gianturco Rubin 1 stent. It's a very primitive stent. You can see how tissue prolapse might be a problem. The stent below is the Palmaz Shat stent. Initially, the, the, it was a Palmaz stent only without that central bridge. So that's 15 millimeters of stiffness. It could only be delivered with a multi purpose guide. So, those of you that work in the cath lab, you couldn't put it through a Judkins catheter, uh, a Judkins uh, left, that is to say, it would not make the bends. And there have been a number of advances in coronary stenting coming, dating back into the, uh, to the 1990s. High pressure implantation guided by IVIS. Antonio Colombo gets the credit for recognizing that without IVIS, we often under deployed stents, DAPT, a, a, a transition from simple to complex stent geometry, thick to thin struts, drug eluting stents, and certain polymers that actually make drug eluting stents safer or more resistant to stent thrombosis than bare metal stents these days. In the more recent decade just completed, there's been a recognition of the importance of complete revascularization, move toward the use of coronary physiology, and also image-guided implantation. Stents also have continued to evolve, and now we have the opportunity to use so-called ultra-thin strutted stents. This slide is intended to be a critique and not a criticism of the ischemia <laughs> trial, which was a very, very well run trial. But if the, if the field that's being studied evolves, and if the advances yield major gains, then the trial results may no longer be valid. And this is true across the field of medicine. So you've seen this slide, I'm gonna go through this. Dr. Hockman has reviewed the trial very well. I would like to make a couple of points about the nature of the patients in the trial. First of all, the females were underrepresented, as were African-Americans. 20% um, of patients had prior myocardial infarction. And as reviewed, uh, angina, particularly after treatment, was relatively infrequent. So most patients had angina one to three times a month, but a full third of patients hadn't had angina in the, in the last month. These are the curves that uh, Dr. Hockman reviewed. Uh, just a couple points to be made. By the end of four years, a quarter of patients in the conservative arm had, I'm going to use the term, but I need to define it, crossed over to a revascularization, and about 80% of patients referred to the invasive approach had indeed had revascularization. Of the patients getting revascularization, uh, three quarters of them had uh, angioplasty, that is stenting, cabbage. This is not a crossover in a pejorative sense at all. This is part of the treatment strategy. I need to make that very clear. All right. This is a, a 
sort of a blow up of some of the curves that have been shown. Again, there's an excess of uh, primary endpoint early in the invasive group, primarily due to, prim to uh, periprocedural myocardial infarction. And then later on, there's a, a crossover of the curves as noted, and there's a numerically different, numeric difference in the primary endpoint driven primarily by a difference in spontaneous myocardial infarction. Now, could that be expected? And the answer is yes. We had a hint of that as far back as uh, Sripal Bangalore's meta-analysis published in circulation in 2013, showing about a 20% reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction driven by, by PCI. Now, it would be nice if we had some biology or uh, pathophysiology uh, to sort of undergird whether this is a, a real finding or not. I think, quite honestly, if you ask a medical student, they can describe the mechanism. So in the presence of an obstructive epicardial stenosis, there is, of course, a pressure drop. But more germane to this discussion, there's flow separation and a change in shear, low shear or eddies beyond the epicardial stenosis. And what that does is it downregulates vasoprotective factors and upregulates inflammatory oxidative stress and thrombogenic factors. To give you just one example, on the y-axis is stimulated TNF alpha with varying degrees of stimulation displayed across the x-axis. If I could draw your attention to the far right, that in the our clear bar, that's the stimulated TNF in patients with an FFR less than 0.75. In the dark bar, barely, barely discernible right next to it, is the stimulated TNF with patients with an FFR greater than 0 0.80. I think for the interest of time, I'll skip over the differences in quality of life, but it's very interesting to see that the reduction in angina with revascularization does appear to be somewhat durable. These are updated meta-analysis, and as Dr. Hockman has shown, uh, even with the inclusion of this trial, the ischemia CKD trial, and FAME2, there's no difference in overall mortality. But when one looks at myocardial infarction, one sees on the top no difference overall. On the very bottom, the difference favoring optimal medical therapy. And in the middle, a reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction now at about 24%. So let's look then at how the ischemia trial did in terms of incorporating the advances over the last decade. I was a little disappointed to see the uh, degree of complete revascularization in the 40 to 45% range. This is lower than achieved in trials with more advanced disease such as syntax. And quite honestly, we're used to seeing 55 to 65% complete revascularization. Coronary physiology was used relatively infrequently, but in defense of the uh, trial investigators, they already had fairly advanced non-invasive imaging. So I think that that's, uh, that 20% needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Apparently, I spoke to Sri Paul Bangalore about this, IVUS and OCT, the, the use and the nature of the use wasn't tracked particularly carefully within the trial. Dr. Hockman can refute if that's true. And there were no patients received uh, contemporary ultra-thin strutted stents. I'm going to digress just a minute to talk about the use of image-guided stenting because it's very important. And those of us that work in the cath lab at the Cleveland Clinic have seen a real sea change in the use of this. We now don't put stents in without image guiding, except in about 10%. That is to say, 90% of the patients in the Cleveland Clinic lab receive stents under uh, invasive imaging. So to look a little more carefully at one of the critical trials, the ultimate trial, uh, a successful stent implantation required a minimum luminal cross-sectional area in the stented segment of more than 5 millimeters squared, or 90% of the distal reference CSA, the plaque burden within 5 millimeters of the edges less than 50%, and no major edge dissections. So what does IVUS do for stenting? And this is a meta-analysis published a couple of years ago. And these are randomized trials. There's a 38% reduction in myocardial infarction and a 50% reduction in target lesion revascularization. Now, there are some remaining key issues about this. We, we fully don't understand exactly what an acceptable landing zone is. We debate this in the cath lab all the time. We also debate or at least consider what the trade-off might be between landing in a less diseased segment and of course, if you do that, you extend the stent length. So is there, a, is there a downside by the use of longer stents? And that's a 
That's a randomized trial waiting to be done. I'd also like to make mention that there's more, of course, to outcomes than just the stint itself. Uh, remember that residual syntax score and CAD risk factor management also greatly impact the long-term post-DES outcomes. And I'll emphasize that by showing you data from the Cleveland Clinic. These are 10-year-plus follow-ups looking at freedom from MACE. And you can see statin use on the left with high-intensity statins in blue. You can see the upper curve. With no statin use, you can see early separation in the purple curve. With low-intensity statins, you see an intermediate curve. With regard to residual syntax score, and this were all core lab adjudicated, if you have complete revascularization in purple, you have the upper curve. If you have a syntax score of 12 or greater, you have the curve in red. And of course, there's an intermediate zone. Uh, germane to the discussion about the importance of residual syntax score, you have to understand that there are differences in these patient populations beyond the residual syntax score, as often the inability to revascularize is because of diffuse disease. So I'll leave you with this image and return the slides and the podium to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. And we'll continue the discussion with Dr. Bakim, who's going to talk about the surgeon's perspective on the ischemia trial and its uh, implications. Dr. Bakim. Thank you, Vino. And uh, it's great to be here with you today. Um, Dr. Razav is here with us in this room, so it's uh, great to see him. It's all about legacy, and uh, we are thankful that he's with us. Talking about legacy, we celebrated uh, a few years ago the 50th anniversary of Cabbage by writing this editorial, uh, myself and my colleagues, including Dr. Svensson. Um, this slide tells us basically two important messages. One is the importance of the heart team. The heart team started here at the Cleveland Clinic, and the heart team endures to this day. We choose the best therapy tailored for the patient's needs, the patient's physiologic and anatomic condition. Also, this slide tells you that cabbage also endured because over all those years, cabbage have saved many lives and will focus in my talk about three main things that I want to drive through to you. One is that you can't lump cabbage and PCI. They are used for different indications and they have different outcomes. Two, the benefits of cabbage are associated to the anatomic burden of the atherosclerotic disease and that cannot be ignored. Finally, when we talk about outcomes, we can't talk about three-year outcomes, five-year outcomes. We should be talking about five, 10, 20, 30 years outcome, as I will demonstrate in my slides. And then before I start with my review of the literature and evidence, I'd like to thank Dr. Hockman for a fantastic review of her seminal study that in no doubt will guide practice uh, for many years to come. So as you can see from this slide, uh, when you compare medical therapy to invasive strategy, most of those are older studies. Nevertheless, the uh, consistent finding is that there tend to be no difference in outcomes between medical therapy and PCI in stable coronary artery disease, but that there is a difference favoring cabbage when it comes um, to comparison with optimal medical management. Now, patients, uh, people say, well, medical management improved. Well, cabbage also improved, and PCI improved, as pointed out by Dr. Ellis. And those very medicines that improve outcomes in the medical arm, they also improve um, conduit patency and cabbage and PCI outcomes at the same time. So the argument that, hey, you can't compare the old medicine with, you know, new medicine. Well, you can't compare, you know, old surgery with new surgery and PCI for that matter. So this is the uh, Salim Yusuf study um, that showed that cabbage was superior to optimal medical management, um, and the benefit increased, as you can see, from the bars on the right side based on the anatomic burden. And Dr. Hockman demonstrated that this holds true even in modern studies. When we compare outcomes between cabbage, PCI, and medical therapy, cabbage 
is usually associated with improved all-cause mortality and cardiac mortality. Now, this study was um, focusing on low EF. Nevertheless, that tells you that the three therapies are different in their outcomes. And again, we can't bundle cabbage and PCI when we compare invasive versus conservative therapy because this meta-analysis shows that cabbage is usually associated with improved all-cause mortality and cardiac mortality. And the advantage of cabbage, again, is related to the anatomic burden. And so in multivessel disease and diabetics who have aggressive atherosclerosis, cabbage, again, seems to be associated with improved outcomes based on this randomized trial, the Freedom Trial. And this separation of curves became statistically significant with follow-up. So that tells you that follow-up is important. Again, you know, when you talk to patients, you got to ask them, do they want to be there for the wedding of their daughter and their granddaughter? You're not going to be telling them whether they want to be here um, and in good health for the next year or five years. They're interested um, in the long-term outcomes, and that should be discussed with the patient up front. What about in left main disease? Well, there's controversy uh, driven mostly by the Excel trial. But if you look at all the uh, important trials in left main, such as Syntax, Noble, Precombat, with or without Excel, this analysis by an independent, um, respected authority in the field demonstrated that cabbage has the upper hand. And the probability of this being statistically accurate is 85 to 99 percent. What are odds that are better than that? But how could we explain this anatomically? Well, if you look at this study from Boston, if you look at the culprit lesion site for an acute event, it's usually in the first seven centimeters of the coronary vessel. When we bypass, when we do a cabbage in the OR, we go to the mid to distal vessel. So not only do we offer immediate protection, we offer future protection. Again, follow-up is important. So this is an 87-year-old patient who's related to me, and I keep showing those slides because his native coronaries are gone. The only reason he's with us 28 years later, 28 years later, is a patent mammary to the LAD that lights up the entire heart through collaterals. Now tell me what medicine or stent could be keeping this guy alive. I don't think so. So let's look at the guidelines. These are being updated as we speak, but cabbage appropriately gets a class one indication for three vessel disease, left main disease, and two vessel disease with proximal LAD. So, when we look at the ischemia trial, it's important to carefully look at the data that we have and interpret the evidence based on the data and the facts on the ground. The caveats, from my perspective as a surgeon, is that this study was not designed to compare medical therapy with cabbage. Only 26% of the revascularization procedures were actually cabbage. Three quarters of them were PCI. And less than half, less than half, had a significant proximal LAD lesion. And we saw from the slides of Dr. Hockman that this makes a difference. So if less than half of the patients had a low atherosclerotic burden, specifically no proximal LAD lesion, well, then you might not see a difference in the treatment arms based on that. The follow-up, median follow-up was only 3.2 years. And that is short, in my opinion. So the take-home message is, from my interpretation, and I think that reflects many people, uh, either in the surgical arena or the cardiology and beyond arena, that have looked at the data, the interpretation that we come up with is that the, 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 the ischemia study was designed primarily to compare medical therapy to revascularization to treat moderate to large myocardial ischemia. The trial performed as expected. There was no surprises, actually, and demonstrated that both cabbage and PCI improved symptoms. This study was not designed 
to actually answer more than that, in my opinion. It was not power to determine whether cabbage improved survival and the follow-up was too short, even if adequately powered to demonstrate a survival benefit for cabbage. Remember, the goal in the ischemia trial of revascularization was complete ischemic, ischemic rather than anatomic revascularization. That's an important distinction. And again, the slides of Dr. Hockman demonstrated that the anatomic severity correlated with outcomes, but the ischemic burden did not. The fourth point is that patients enrolled in ischemia were not representative of patients that we as heart teams typically recommend cabbage for. The benefits of cabbage are related to the atherosclerotic burden and are more manifest with time. How can we increase the advantage of cabbage? I'm going to go quickly and emphasize the importance of multi-arterial grafting, again first demonstrated at the clinic and again manifesting later. Follow-up is important. And the more myocardial therapy that we supply with arteries, the better the outcomes, including all-cause mortality. And this is the R trial. When you look at the uh, as-treated analysis, because it was design flaws and the radials were lumped with a single artery rather than multi-artery, there was a difference in survival between the arms of multi-arterial versus single arterial grafting. And I think multi-arterial grafting should be done by experienced surgeons who know how to do them and achieve the best outcomes. So in conclusion, Cabbage prolongs life and reduces MIs in patients with stable coronary artery disease. Ischemia findings does not change that. Multi-arterial grafting provides and enhances the cabbage advantage. PCI and medical managements are important complementary treatments to cabbage, and we heart team, heart team members should take those points into consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Faisal, for that overview. And... Uh, uh, congratulations, Dr. Hockman, again, on doing such a wonderful strategy trial that's been, uh, I think, just terrific. Uh, uh, we have about five or ten minutes left, and so, Dr. Hockman, uh, let me ask you a question to start with. Um, obviously, the, the, a great trial is one that then leads to further questions. And so, as you look back at the ischemia trial and what it's taught us, what do you think is the need for the future in stable ischemic heart disease? If there's a couple of things you would love to know looking ahead, what would those be? Well, that's a, a great and, uh, question, and I can answer that on multiple levels. I, I, you know, I'm going to come back to basics and say, you know, implementation science to understand how to get pa patients to better comply with medical therapy and lifestyle change is probably the biggest impact we can make. But in terms of for this specific panel and for this specific discussion, I think an active area of investigation is the lower EF patients. You know, I don't know why stitch. Well, I, I guess I know why. There had to be an arbitrary cutoff for uh, ejection fraction 35% to be included. I'd love to see that broaden to 50%. I think there's something there in terms of... Uh, the, the lower EF and multi-vessel disease and improving survival, even in the modern um, era where uh, medical therapy as well as new techniques and bypass uh, surgery have gotten uh, much, much, much um, um, better. Um, and I think PCI versus cabbage, because a lot of these patients are getting PCI. We, we know that the cabbage rates are pretty you know, stable and PCI rates have been going up um, uh, over time. So... That's how I would answer that. I do want to make one comment, Venu, um, uh, about how we use trials when the field is changing. And certainly there are advances in, uh, in intervention, PCI, there are advances in bypass surgery, and there are advances in medical therapy. And the question is, do they balance each other out? What is the evidence that those advances are leading to a difference in outcome? And I think myocardial infarction, cardiovascular death, and all-cause death. Certainly, cardiovascular death and all-cause death um, make, uh, are most important to patients as well as symptoms. And since the ischemia trial, I alluded to this, rivaroxaban in the Tampas trial, low dose plus low dose aspirin reduced cardiovascular death. SGLT2 inhibitors reduced cardiovascular death. I don't know of other interventional techniques 
that have actually been shown to reduce cardiovascular deaths. So when you're saying, does this trial really apply now in the modern era, you need to ask, what is the evidence that those new advances actually have changed some, some outcomes? So I would pose that question um, to the group. That's terrific. And, and then the other question I had, which was comparing apples and oranges, but when you take a look at stable ischemic heart disease and you compare it to the acute coronary syndrome, in acute coronary syndromes, the more and more we revascularize the non-culprit vessel, we reduce events very, very quickly. So is it the stable disease that's behaving differently in those two conditions, or are we underestimating plaques in acute coronary syndrome, which is leading to that benefit. Dr. Ellis, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think that um, certainly in the lifetime of a CAD patient, there are plaque instabilities that are sometimes clinically manifest and sometimes not. So I, I think it's probably appropriate to think of a patient with ACS as having some unstable plaques or sometimes erosion or other mechanisms for their ACS on top of stable, stable disease. So it's actually an admixture of pathophysiologies. But clearly the, the uh, unstable plaques are probably more amenable to aggressive medical therapy, but more, more risky with a medical therapy alone. I would, I Any would comments, Dr. Hockman? I want to make one quick comment back to Dr. Hockman, and she's, of course, right that medicine has advanced. But just because I put a stent in doesn't mean I can't put the patient on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Dr. Hawkman, any comments there? Um, well, the question is, never mind. I'm not going to respond to, to, to that last one. But in, in terms of, um, Ben, remind me of your question. Uh, no, I, I was just saying that, you know, when we do all our ACS trials, yes, there's yes, such yes, a dramatic yes, divergence yes. in the curves in the yes. early, early post-infarct period. And yes. one would suspect that many of those non-infarct vessels were previously present and they were stable disease, but the curves diverged so dramatically. So I was wondering whether that was our, uh, you know, that was just our inability to identify lesion vulnerability or were they just two completely different diseases and we can't take the lessons of one to the other? Yeah, so I think they are just different, different diseases. We know a couple of things about acute coronary syndrome. We know from imaging the non-infarct vessels that there are um, active plaques. You find plaque rupture and plaque erosion, and that this is systemic inflammatory state, right? Your CRP is elevated, your IL-6 uh, is elevated, and it, it's a different entity than stable ischemic heart disease. So I think that that, um, th that largely explains the difference in those findings. And I'll end with one last thing, and I'll have all of the authors comment. I think the biggest lesson I learned from here is to really need to validate the anginal score. And rather than say there is angina or no angina, uh, one of the lessons here is to be able to really quantify the burden of it. And so, Faisal, do you think that you know, going forwards, as you assess angina, that's something that we should be really quantifying rather than saying it's present or not? Well, you know... I'm a surgeon, I'm focused on anatomy, and, and it turns out that anatomy is very important. The more severe the atherosclerosis, uh, the more the benefit of intervention. But I'd like to comment on Dr. Ellis's point, and Dr. Hockman as well, if I may. She brings up a really important point, that there's incremental advances in the medical management. Can you prove that you have the same incremental advance in cabbage or PCI? I don't think we can answer that, but Dr. Ellis is right. They're additive in their benefit to patients. But I will yield, I will develop equipoise, and I will take my hat off to Dr. Hockman if she could demonstrate to me anatomically that those new drugs reverse the atherosclerotic lesions. Then in patients with stable disease, I would tell them, don't have the surgery, because if you have stable symptoms and you're taking that drug that's gonna reverse the lesion, then there's no indication for cabbage. But this drug is not available yet. Rivaroxaban prevents thrombosis at the site of the existing lesions. It does not reverse that lesion. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellis, any comments on the anginal part of it? And should we be much more serious in terms of quantifying it? Well, I, I think in general, I'd like to make a couple of points here. First of all, 
when we look at the breadth of patients with stable ischemic heart disease, I think we have to realize that it's only a minority for whom we even have a possibility of changing their lethal risk. For most patients, it's an issue of symptoms. And yes, I think that we ought to be a little more careful about um, how we grade out symptoms. It was clearly the worse the symptoms, the more the potential benefit, with, with again, with the caveat that, that the, a potential difference in mortality needs to be considered in some patients, but it's really going beyond what we can expect to make a change in mortality for many patients. So short answer, yes, a little bit more commentary. And again, uh, my, my hat's off to Dr. Hockman. I, I may have appeared like I was trying to challenge her, but hats off for a wonderfully performed trial. So I think on that note, I think the hour is nearing and coming to an end, so we'll stop that discussion. But again, I want to thank Dr. Hockman for what I think is a seminal clinical trial in stable ischemic heart disease. And it's been a privilege to have her here spend the hour with us today. Uh, and so thank you, Dr. Hockman, and we hope we can see you in person here in Cleveland very, very soon. So thank you once again. Thank you. I hope to be there soon.